Good evening. Welcome to the first episode of The Script Crypt, the podcast where we get into unmade screenplays, drafts of, you know, old superhero movies, uh, dream projects that filmmakers never got to uh, to get in front of the cameras. So we're going to break down those screenplays and get into an alternate history of Hollywood that kind of never happened. Anyway, my name is Sean Smithson. I'm Mark Middlemas. I'm Ryan Call. I'm Blake Castleman. And, uh, yeah, collectively, we're the Script Crypt Keepers. So we're going to let Mark uh, let you uh, kick things off with our first Sure. Our first film. Well, here's the big reveal, and you probably saw it on the label. But uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Alien 3. Specifically, we're going to talk about the first of ten different drafts that were written for Alien 3 by none other than uh, Techno Wizard, I don't know what you want to call it, William Gibson. The um, father of cyberpunk. Thank, thank you. Thank, thanks, nerds. I'm glad the room... The father of... Yes. Uh, the draft we're going to be looking at was written um, in 1987. And it's interesting because it's uh, Alien 3 by William Gibson from a story by David Geiler and Walter Hill. Now, those are some interesting names. So let's... Before we go any any further here, let's let's ask the question. Who is William, who is William Gibson? Why is this such a big deal? Uh, Neuromancer, man. You know, the, the birth of cyberpunk literature written, ironically on a manual typewriter. <laughs> it's, it's not very often that a modern author is going to get a chance to actually define an entire genre, and this guy did that. Yeah. Uh, Neuromancer was published in 1984, and uh, where William Gibson is considered the father of the cyberpunk genre, the, the uh, late great Philip K. Dick is considered the grandfather of cyberpunk and kind of Blade Runner yeah uh, absolutely Total Recall the concepts are there the love of technology uh, William Gibson also coined the term cyberspace yeah yeah. Uh, which which helped him get the crown mm-hmm. sure yeah that, absolutely know. so I don't know if this was William Gibson's first crack at writing a screenplay but this like you said Mark uh, this was written in 1987 mm-hmm. so we're talking it's one year three one year after the release right. of James Cameron's Aliens uh, three years after the publication of of Neuromancer uh, so about so this time uh, a hot ticket. about this time Gibson because I was reading him at this time too um, and back then we didn't really have the internet so I didn't know he was writing a draft for Alien 3 or I would have lost my shit as a kid <laughs> but uh, about this time he was also being pushed hard on the paperback racks with Mona Lisa Overdrive with mm-hmm. that beautiful yeah. fo- uh, foil face cover you know, it's a really eye catching so he was like a hot hot property too so Mona Lisa Overdrive came directly after this th- this draft it came this this was between Count Zero Mona Lisa Overdrive and so uh, from from what I can tell immediately after this draft is when Mona Lisa Overdrive was released so he'd already written it hadn't been released yet wow okay um I had a really cool experience. I'm just going to tell you this real quick. Sundance, 1997. I'm taking a class at the University of Utah. I had the opportunity to just take the whole quarter, it was quarters back then, and go to Sundance. They were going to give me I hear take the hours. whole quarter and someone like yeah. me thinks yeah. something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. They told me to take the eight ball, and then, oh God. look, I was up. <laughs> crack it down. Anyway, um, so went up there, and I had to do one day where I went to a panel. Never been to a panel. Didn't even know what that was. Took me all day to find a place to park up there. It's, it was a mess. I'm like, this is this is awful. I chose one at random. I'm walking into the room and a guy bumps into me. And there's a lot of people. It's a small corridor, and I'm and a big guy. And I felt bad. I said, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get you there. And he goes, oh, no problem. I look up. It's Roger Ebert. And this is Roger Ebert in his prime. And my brain just goes, blah, 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 blah. and I, I didn't freak out. I just kept moving. And I thought, you, you gave him the thumbs up. Didn't I you? didn't do <laughs> anything. The big smile. I, nothing. I just said, don't blow this, man. Don't blow this. There may be a chance. Who knows? Um, and I go into the room and I'm like, I'm so, I'm just like, I just I seriously just jostled Roger Ebert. Uh, Not- I go in the room and the panel is, I can't remember who the other two authors and or visionaries were because writers don't matter because it was william gibson and douglas adams holy schmoly and it was wow. phenomenal to spend an hour listening to these guys and it was also the first time that i God, ever, now i want to know who the other writers are i know too, i need to go back and look. i'm content. sure it's out yeah. there somewhere we'll, we'll try to remember and put yeah. it in the notes john perry barlow and paulina borsuk fact okay. checker there you go but i remember too it was the very first time i was ever in a panel and a guy got up 
and did that thing where he never asks a question. He talks about himself for 15 I'm minutes. I'm going to join the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm qualified to join this conversation. This My guy, explanation comes in 16 parts. This guy, Part kept, one. this guy kept bragging about how he had done some work for Playboy magazine, and he kept saying it over and over and over. And finally he was said something <laughs> stupid like, so how do I get the internet? <laughs> like, and I, cause I remember distinctly thinking, dude, it's an AOL disc. You get them in the mail. Sit down, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> so, William Gibson, very big deal. Now there are two other interesting names on this, uh, on the story credit here, David Geiler and Walter Hill. Walter Hill, uh, David Geiler, maybe, you know, I'm a little less. He was, he's been a producer, yeah. done some directing and writing. He was involved in Myra Breckenridge, if you know what that is. Yeah. Uh, the Gore Vidal. Rachel Welch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, um, in fact, I just saw a great movie that referenced that, uh, Best of Enemies. Um, good Gore movie. Vidal and William Real, F. Buckley. Really good doc. But they talk a lot about Myra Breckenridge. Mm -hmm. That plays into that. By the way, I, I love Gore Vidal. Let me just throw that out there right now. Yep, no, what's, uh, what do they say on Simpsons? Even, even uh, Gore Vidal's kiss more boys than me, so. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Um, but the interesting thing about David Geiler is his collaboration with a certain gentleman by the name of Walter Hill, who may be a little more familiar. 48 you got an Hours, old. Extreme Prejudice, just made another movie, which is rare for these guys because they have trouble getting movies made. Joe Donnie can't get a movie no. made. Walter Hill the can't pen, get a movie geez. made. Or the uh, yeah, and uh, you know, okay. and them being Sorry. unfamiliar with the new terrain yeah. of digital filmmaking doesn't help either. Yeah. He just did a movie with Michelle Rodriguez where uh, she's a male hitman who's <laughs> given a forced sex change by someone. Which I uh, I said you know that old movie yeah. again. I said well I said we want to do face off, Ryan, but where we went actually, high, we want to go low. Actually, it is very reminiscent of a film by a uh, recent film by Pedro Almodovar called The Skin I Live In. Oh sure, mm. yeah. yeah. But, which is a kind of a Frankenstein yeah. thing too, but yeah, Walter Hill. So he's kind of back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Warriors. The, the Warriors. Yeah. Exactly. Compulsively watchable the drama action yep. films. Drop, from drop me in any place in that movie. I know the next line. Now, See? here's a big one. The other movie he was involved in, which may sound familiar, which may ring a bell. Southern Comfort. Anybody know this? Film? Oh yeah. Yes. Powers yeah. Booth. Uh, Keith Carradine. Very, you know very James, underrated film. Do you know how 80s. James Cameron pitched Aliens? Southern Comfort in Space. Did he really? Yes. Huh. So, there was quite, so, Hill. That's and, back when executives would go, that's a great idea. Yeah. I love Southern Comfort. Green light it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, a great, Powers Booth, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway. Uh, Brian James, who's the uh, android who shoots the guy, the, uh, the android. Is Brian James. The love Cage Brian guys. James. Tell me about your mother. One yeah. of the Cage yeah. guys. Yeah. So, uh, Guyler and Hill um, have the co-story credit on Dan O'Bannon's script. There was quite a bit of a problem in Alien. Uh, they fought over who would ultimately get the credit, and Oban and Oban and won. But they also had the co-writing on Aliens, Alien Three, and ultimately <sighs> Alien Resurrection. <laughs> and I think the AVP movies. If yes, I'm not and Re Requiem which, as well. Which uh, it's going to get interesting because when screenwriters write for a studio, it's work for hire. So there was a scene in the original Alien that Ridley Scott couldn't pull off. He wanted to have a hole in the hull the size of a thumbnail and have one of the crew members sucked out of the hole. <laughs> they could they just simply didn't have the technology to do it. Yeah. You know, puppets wasn't going to work. Weird yeah, balloon wasn't yeah. going to work. You see that scene at the end of Alien Resurrection. Oh, jeez. You see the alien mm -hmm. yeah. get sucked out of the thumb hole. There's a lot of uh, elements from the from this screenplay we're going to get into yep. that I think rear their heads in Alien Resurrection and Papa. Yep. Well, and here's the thing about Alien Resurrection. I'm looking at it on IMDb right now, and Walter Hill and um, uh, David Geiler. David Geiler are not listed as... No, they took their names off. They took their names off. It. And they have... And Joss Whedon did not. No, he did not. <laughs> Toy Story and Alien Resurrection, yeah. Um, so, let's get it. So, obviously, we've got some, some real talent working on this script. Uh, it came a year after uh, Aliens, which, undeniably, a, a, a trend-setting classic film. Alien, also, you go from horror to terror. Um, so, where's... Where is left to go? Well, let's find out. Um, so let's let's talk about the script, and maybe let's get into a synopsis of the script. Well, how about should we read the opening scene and then get into a synopsis? I like it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a little bad acting from your script key. Uh, well, or maybe great acting, because you know what, you're Vincent. Pro no, what did you do before? It wasn't Vincent Price. You uh, you had a great impression here about 
half an hour, never mind. John Biner and Rich Little. I am I impersonate him. <laughs> uh, thank you. I didn't just ruin the podcast. So we're go- we're gonna go round house so we all get a chance to yeah. read. Let's go and by I'll, paragraph. Yeah, and uh, and I'll and I'll start. Um, this is the opening scene from William Gibson's Alien Three draft. All right, fade in. Deep space, the future. The silent field of stars eclipsed by the dark bulk of an approaching ship. Angle on the hull. A towering cliff of metal. Sulaco. Interior, Sulaco. Hypersleep ball. Tracking down the line of empty open capsules. Frozen twilight. The final four capsules are sealed. Lids in place. Newt, then Ripley. Hicks next. His head and chest bandaged. Then Bishop and his call of plastic. But the lid of Bishop's capsule is misted with hothouse condensation. A tear of fluid streaks the condensation. An alarm sounds. A monitor begins to scroll data. Troop transport, Sulaco. CMC 846A, Beta. Mission, LV-426, return. Status, red. Treaty violation. Reference number 998G558L5. Cause, navigational error. Bland, feminine voice of the ship's computer as the alarm continues to sound. Attention. (laughs) Attention. Due to the failure of navigational security, Sulaco has entered a sector claimed by the... (laughs) by the Union of Progressive Peoples. Auxiliary systems are now online. Course corrected. Hardwire protocols prevent. Repeat. Prevent. Arming of nuclear warheads in the absence of diplomatic override. Decryption standard Charlie 9. On present course, Sulaco will exit the N- the UPE. <laughs> Come on. Sector. That means the Union of Progressive Peoples <coughs> in the screenplay, by the right. way, everyone. Sector at 1900 hours 53.8 minutes. Exterior Sulaco. The ship slides past beneath us. A UPP interceptor descends into frame, matching course and speed with Sulaco. The interceptor settles on Sulaco like a wasp. The interior interceptor. Three commandos climb into space suits. The leader opens the hatch in the deck, revealing one of the Sulaco's airlocks. First commando, a young Vietnamese woman, scrambles down and attaches magnetic units to the airlock. Second commando studies a monitor, tapping out a sequence on a keyboard. First commando gestures from the hatch, no good. Second commando tries again, a grating sound as the Sulaco's airlock begins to open. Interior Sulaco, cargo lock, darkness. Armed commandos climb through opening, through an opening and descend the ladder, reaching the deck they fan out, weapons ready. Their leader examines the damaged dropship. First commando gestures urgently, she's found something. Bishop's legs, broken, grotesquely twisted, steel and fatigues. The white android blood clotted into powder. First and second commandos exchange looks, look, exchange looks through their faceplates. Computer, attention, integrity breach, cargo lock three, security alert, integrity breach, B deck. Interior hypersleep vault, leader's POV. The chilly aisle of capsules, commandos move down the line, guns poised. They peer in at Newt, Ripley, and Hicks, but the lid of Bishop's capsule is pearl white. The leader tries the controls at the foot of the capsule where green and red indicators glow. Nothing happens. He opens a panel, finds an emergency lever, and tries it. The green indicator winks off. The lid rises. A dense, pale mist blows out, spilling over the edges of the capsule, revealing the ovoid of a gray alien egg. Rooted in the center of Bishop's synthetic entrails, the egg instantly ejaculates a face hugger, which strikes the leader's faceplate in a spray of acid. He screams, blinded by the acid, grappling with the thing as it begins. He plunges blindly back down the aisle, stumbling, smashing into the empty capsules. He vanishes through the entranceway, his screams giving way to frenzied gagging sounds. The first commander scrambles after him. Interior, cargo lock. Leader rise on the deck beside the main cargo lock. First commando rushes in, crouches beside him, takes careful two-handed aim with her sidearm. She fires attempting to kill the facehugger without hitting the leader. The facehugger explodes in a gout of acid. Ragged holes burn through the side of his helmet. First commando frantically works the lock controls. At the interlock, as the interlock opens, she shoves the leader over the edge with her foot. Exterior Sulaco, helmetless, headless, 
trailing a cloud of blood and acid, the leader tumbles through space. Interior cargo lock. Eyes of the first commando through her faceplate. Beat. Something moves behind her. She spins, bringing up her gun. Backlit in the entrance of the vault, a black, multi-armed figure. The beam from her lamp finds it. The second commando, with Bishop in his arms. Yeah! Boom, and there's the opening. Oh, man. They come out, okay. I, I, he comes out swinging, right? He comes out swinging. Yes, absolutely. Uh, hitting a lot of the same themes, but continuing that, that feeling, setting up um, how the U... The UPP works. <laughs> that they're uh, that they're no nonsense. Um, setting up the mystery, give, uh, continuing the story. I like the. I like a real the, sense uh, of action. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I like the uh, almost like the, the the crawl in the beginning of every yes. Star Wars movie. Exactly. I like the way they're setting up. Every time you see a new Alien film, there's going to be a ship with people breaking into it, going, what is here? What is here, yeah. And there's a nice sort of summary of the sort of life cycle of the, the creature we're gonna be dealing with. That, so if somebody walks into this movie having not seen the first two movies, it's hard to imagine that happening, but assuming it did, yeah. um, they have a sense of, all right, here's the bad, here's what uh, what can take place. And what a great image of the egg in Bishop's entrails. I mean, The just ejaculating like, egg. <laughs> Brilliant. Which also drives home the fact that Bishop is not just an android. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something. Yeah, yeah the, there's something human about yeah, him. Yeah, human enough that he was yeah, impregnated that, or yeah, yeah. Well, whatever we want to call or it. Or even yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. <laughs> oh, this movie's going to be made. Nope. Sorry. No, I'm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this movie's not getting made ever. We're, we're looking for our cards. Oh, you just had them right oh, here. Oh, there. So, Mark, you want to start breaking down uh, the plot line of this? So well, let's. You, yeah, let's go ahead and start talking about what happens. Let's, let's well, just jump and, in. And, and, and before we get into the actual yeah. plot, I think it should be mentioned that this was planned as the first of two movies Clearly. that they were going to do. And it was by design. See, I, I read this script without reading the background, and I was a little dismayed that Ripley uh, basically was asleep. Yeah. the entire story. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about because, that. Because here's a character, here's a breakout <laughs> character, here's a character that basically established the modern female uh, hero, uh -huh. the action hero. Well, it, and, yeah. and, and here's a character where Sigourney Weaver had just won the Academy Award for Best Actress, and she's not part <laughs> of the movie at all. And We've heard and, of it from her. <laughs> well, I wonder, I, there are a lot of times where... Uh, writers are given an assignment that's kind of a what if and I wonder if this wasn't the the, the safety assignment. Well I wanted to ask that yeah, yeah. what and if she we, doesn't want to come on board. Well that's this exactly this is did. what was we decided. This Weaver. is what this is what was decided and it was decided with Sigourney Weaver's blessing that she would have a cameo in this film and Hicks would be the protagonist. Right. Mm. right. And then Working the second film <laughs> the second film, which would have been the fourth film would have shifted back to Ripley's right. Gotcha. Right. Uh, and would have picked up her story and she would have become the protagonist again for that film. Cool. Well, let's let's get into the actual plot to find out how that happened. And then we're going to come back around because we want to take the position of the executives determining, is this the movie that should have been made? Right. So let's start going. So, so we have the opening scene right. where uh, the um, Union of Progressive Peoples, which is uh, part of an arms race, uh, they're they're one of two competitors in an, in an arms race. Uh, well, let's break this down. This is it's really a, this was written in '87. We forget that Glasnost was still a very important right, phrase. Sure. This, this is, is Cold War. This is this is as the wall is coming down. Yeah. So uh, the UPP. Well, the, 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 the wall two years the wall is two years away. This is Gor Sorry. This is yeah. Gorbachev and us going. Oh wait, something's happening. Yeah. This is '87, I believe, is the year Reagan said Mr. Gorbachev tear, tear down that wall. Yeah. yeah. But the UPP is your stand-in for the Communist Bloc. Right. You got your Nanko, you got your drop off, you got your, you got your Kuchap, you got your never mind. So, so is is the company then the American government? Capitalism, man, unfettered okay. and, and and yeah, I mean it's it, it does appear to be a, a stand in for that very much that eighties rabid yeah. rap. I mean Wayland Utani. There's the, that Utani has kind of a, an Asian feel uh -huh. to it, so you kind of got that combination of which was. Big on the minds of Americans, of Ameri as America and Japan were starting to cultural. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, now answer me this: yeah. in the script, Whalen Utani is actually named. 
Yes, sir. Is are. this the first time they're named? Are they named in either the the previous two films? Yes, and I'll tell you where. Um, now, I know for a fact that you see the Wayland Yutani sign in in the extended cut of the Aliens films. So when you go to the there's the, we're, we're talking the James Cameron Aliens. Yes. So okay. Aliens, uh, the extended cut where they show the colony before they before Newt's family finds uh, the ship. Okay. You actually see Wayland Yutani written on everything. It actually says Wayland Yutani. Otherwise, we always hear it as the company. The company. Yeah. Yeah. I could be wrong. Someone out there is probably screaming, "No, no, you fools!" <laughs> or even worse, no one is. <laughs> So uh, we're still kind of working out how to do this, so please bear with us uh, with our process. But so we read you the opening scene. Yes. Um, that's followed by we're introduced to the characters Tully and Jackson. Um, they're aboard uh, a, a ship called Anchor Point. It's like a space base space, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like a space station, a huge, like the one you see in Aliens, basically, mm-hmm. where... You've got Gateway... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to nerd out. You've got a Gateway point. Station. Yeah, then, exactly. Which is the big Earth orbiter, and then... Did you get this? Is this what is this station? Is it a military station? Is it a research station? I think it's all the above. Because it yeah, seemed right. to have all, it's all of, of the that. above. Yeah. And it seems like, and it well, seems like there's a because there's a moment in the script where they're looking for some rationale for doing investigation yeah. into the and, and they say, well, cancer we'll, we'll just call it cancer research. Yeah. And we're okay. So yeah. obviously it's got to yeah. be kind of a multi-use deal. Well, yeah. let's break so, it down for the next five minutes or so. Go go ahead, Blake. If you have something to say, in the script, in, in in Gibson's description in the script, when he introduces the station, he says a station the size of a small moon. But that's, that's no moon. That's no moon. No moon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but then he gives a little, and, and and that was my first thought, Death Star. But then he gives a little bit more description to right. it that it's not the Death Star. Yeah. It's it's something large, but it has uh, a shape unique to itself. To the detriment of the movie, I think, had they made it, it had been the Death Star. Better movie. Oh, man. So, the, so the so the yeah. after the opening scene is then picked up by a second ship who doesn't realize that the Sulaco has already been intercepted by the UPP and they've taken samples of the alien and that's where we meet uh, like a couple of our, our main characters at least for a while Tully and Jackson they're uh, they're culture techs they're they're genetic scientists basically when this career is now not something so specialized. And uh, they're taking samples off the Sulaco. They pull Hicks and uh, and Newt out of out of hypersleep. Uh, there's no Bishop. Bishop is gone. They don't even know Bishop has existed at this point because he's with the the UPP. Yeah, you right. know me. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I know. Had to do it at least had to once. Do it. We had to get the elephant out of the room. But uh, so yeah. So now uh, at on Anchor Point, the Sulaco is being gone over with a fine tooth comb. And they know something is going on too. Well, don't forget. Remember, as they go in, uh, there are uh, there are warriors that attack them, and uh, the hypersleep. Oh, that's right. Right, which is and so they use the flamethrower on the war the two warriors, and they never explain how the warriors got in here. It doesn't matter. Point is, maybe it does matter a lot. I think it matters a little. A little. Regardless, they use the flamethrower, which damages Ripley's capsule, and so they have to rush her to the anchor point emergency room. Uh, where she is promptly in a uh, some sort of inhalation coma yeah. through the rest of the yeah. film. And please continue with this synopsis. We don't know. No, I love what you're doing. You've got your cards. Have to jump around. Uh, yeah. So after Let's they jump in time. So where are we uh, at that point when they take her to the room? Um, this is great. We, we've all read the script. <laughs> now where was that? The big part? words, guys. Yeah. Big words. Well, um, uh, while you're looking, yeah. did, did any of you? think for a while that Tully was going to be the protagonist of the script? Yeah, well, yeah. I don't want to get too far ahead, though, okay. man. Okay. Uh, okay. So, let's just go ahead, Mark. Okay, no take, problem. Take so, the ball with the, so, with the so, Newt and Hicks both survived unharmed, um, which is a... We'll, we'll talk about how that's a... a, 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 a that's a huge contrast. A huge contrast. Very nice. Um, Hicks was able to show his badass side because when they first pulled him out, he's like, where the hell are we? Yeah. Where's yeah. Newton? He gets very protective of Newt. Gibson does a very nice job, I might add, of, of capturing Hicks because I can hear Michael Bean's voice and it sounds right with the dialogue. Mm-hmm. can really hear it. Um, well, so anyway, they, uh, they, they take the material. The scientists take the material, not surprisingly. Hicks... Uh, much like Ripley, has to take a civilian job. His uh, he's suspended um, pending investigation. Um, and we get to see the rad loaders again. He's he's back into basically yeah, and he and he 
There seems to be a lot of parallels yes. uh, with plot points between this and Aliens. Yep. I would almost yep. call them more than parallels. It's, it's a mirror image. It really is. But while he's there, of course, he starts to hear rumors that they took material, that there was an attack, that there was uh, an incident with these two warriors, and they took this material. Because he was sleeping in his capsule on. during this time. Right, right. Um, Newt <laughs> is sent, apparently, safely home. To yeah. Oregon, to New Oregon. Oregon, with her grandparents. And she's going to go, she's gonna go take a quick trip over to Africa, though, because she wants yeah. to see some animals. Hold it's up. just a few hops. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just a, it's just you a quick it, hop over the pond. Exactly. Yeah. You know it's the future because we put new in front now, of now, it. It's like Buck Rogers, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and also her new zip, Phoenix. Her, her zip code Chicago. is uh, is alphanumeric instead. So yeah. that, that, that speaks to the future if nothing does. Who just been attacked by xenophobes, and you basically wake up, and for you it might as well be yesterday. Do you really think you're going to want to go to Africa to see big game? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's the last She's thing working on her issues. Do. I guess so. <laughs> Kids got a pair, man. Well, <laughs> well of course. So um, one of the cool things I, I like about Gibson's script, and we'll talk about this because this is the next plot point, is the communists, sorry, the UPP. Or the UPS. The UPS. Let's, maybe that's safe. I like that the better. Ups. Thanks, Blake. The UPS. The nice, they're the, nice the only UPS joke I have written down. In their brown suits <laughs> are... are also uh, working on the genetic material that they have found for Bishop. Uh, they're discussing what they're going to do yeah, with they're it. they're futzing with it. Yes, because what they realize is this is something special. And there's a great conversation in there about how we can't leave this alone. Well, why? It's dangerous. We don't know if we can control it, but, but uh, we, we, we can't do anything about it. Why? Well, because we know they have it. Well, yeah. so if they have it, we have to work on it. But our science is five years behind theirs. Well, it doesn't matter. We've still got to catch up. And you start seeing the arms race. And there's parallel. a cool there's a cool exchange that happens in that conversation too, where one of the one of the uh, scientists said, "Well, maybe it already is a weapon. Maybe this is an artifact. Maybe this is sure. Maybe yes. this fact, has been created to do this." In fact, let's let's do the line I, real quick. I do so, have that line. So yeah. it's it's Suslov. Yeah says, perhaps it's the fruit of some ancient experiment, a living artifact, the product of genetic engineering, a weapon. Perhaps we're looking at the end result of yet another arms race. And then Braun, who is the authority in the room, says, a defeatist attitude, Colonel Doctor. Yeah. Our pro <laughs> Colonel Doctor. <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> sorry, William. <laughs> Our project yeah. could only strengthen the union of progressive people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Colonel Doctor is futuristic for comrade. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, ha and yeah. how's that sound, right? Yeah, Colonel yeah. Comrade. He, boy, Gibson is, is, I like his technical dialogue. He gets that very, very nicely. It, the, the, it might, I don't know if it would come off stilted, actually spoken, but it, it reads well. It, it, he uh, writes the, like a novelist. On the page. He absolutely does write yeah. like a novelist. And, he, you know, the that's probably the place where you get the most Gibson in this entire script is where he's talking about a servo manipulator, Techno a technocrat, yeah. a cursor cap. He even talks about Windows, which yeah. you know existed on computers then, yeah. but was still kind of new for consumers. We're, we're going to talk about some things that are hariously outdated here in a few minutes, but oh, they so so talk about a VCR, a Walkman-sized yeah, walk 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 VCR. <laughs> VCR. Yes. Let us repeat yes. that clearly. I'm, I'm not old, going, but I have no idea what either of those things are. Yeah. <laughs> Again, a Walkman-sized <laughs> VCR. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, exactly. exactly. Daddy, what's a Walkman? Right. What's a VCR? Uh, well, so, it's going to be a long night. Well, so here we go. So um, what ends up happening, of course, is we find out that, in fact, both sides are working with this material, and the folks at Anchor Point have gone even further. They have learned that they can weaponize this or that it it can be used as a sort of virus. What they don't realize is, uh, they learned the hard way, is that it is Gibson's take on this is that the xenomorphic material is so adaptable and so, and so quickly um, can reproduce so quickly that... It could actually be injected or inhaled or through the bloodstream actually start to transform instantaneously the cellular structure of the victim. Which and is and basically uh, that turns the victim into a xenomorph werewolf style. Exactly. They call it so so as the story goes on, of course, Hicks finds out what's going on. Interestingly enough, Bishop is returned from the UPP to Anchor Point um, as a gesture of goodwill, but it's because they gotten they, everything they need out of him. They've downloaded his, his memory. But Gibson does a nice job of, of dealing with, um, I think this, the scenes between Hicks and Bishop are very nice. Bishop really comes off as um, more than just a protagonist here. He, he gets into this Asimovian idea. Is that a word? I don't know. Sure. You that, yeah. 
that human life must be protected. So yeah. bishops... The, the positronic brain rules. Right, right. So he yeah. must do everything in his power Which, of course, he does, because those are introduced in Aliens by... J I mean, the, that, the, oh, of course, the rules Dash. of the positronic brain have been accepted across science fiction, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. So, um, he, uh, of course... But what's... One of the, the, we won't read it, but the interesting conversation does talk about the fact that Bishop, though, warns him, I don't know if I've been reprogrammed or not. Which is a really self aware thing for a robot to tell yeah, you, right? Yeah. Like, I have concerns about my own motivations yeah. because it's possible that after they downloaded my brain, they reprogrammed me to be a spy, uh -huh. to be a weapon. Yeah. I but, sure wish I could have seen Lance Henriksen <laughs> do that scene. Yeah. 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 But his primary objective is to preserve human life, so he and Hicks at that point decide we have to try to stop this. But of course, they're too late, and we get some great scenes as two of the uh, scientists are infected, and they go through what they call in here, no offense to women of a certain age, the change. <laughs> um, well, and I love and those, I love those beast, characters because beast. because it's a man and a woman, they're from the company. Uh, yeah. They're basically the Carter Burke. Yeah, they're yes. spooks. Yeah, but spooks, but exactly. they don't have a chance to, to meddle like Carter Burke does because almost just a few scenes after we meet them, yeah. they go through that great transformation uh -huh. in, in, in the in kind of the boardroom setting that the yeah. Gibson calls the bubble, which is another great yeah. kind of futuristic cyberpunk. Yeah, it's, What's the, that uh, it's, it's, it's a silent room. Yeah, yeah. it's on the, the, that's the on cone the of point. silence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the room in Get Smart. That's yeah. what I was thinking. More of the Get Smart idea of it. Yeah, and of course, to, to describe. Let's describe the uh, the transformation. It's pretty good. They rip. The, speaking of Cronenberg, they rip their flesh off. And the new beast emerges. This Glistening claws coming away with skin, eyes, muscle, teeth, and splinters of bone. Sound of ripping cloth. The new beast uh -huh. sheds its human skin in a single, sinuous, bloody ripple, molting on fast forward. It sounds almost video drummy, right? The yeah. New, the and new well, skin. You know, as I was reading this, too, because I dreamcast and, and do all that stuff in my head, uh, <laughs> I really would have liked to have seen this made by... Cronenberg. Yeah, like right? Cron mm. Cron it's, yeah. I, 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 I would have been all over Cronenberg to do an alien movie anyway because he is the master of Body, body Betrays Itself. Yep. Yep. yep, all the body dysmorphia stuff. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. He, yeah. in his wheelhouse. God, can you imagine yeah. Cronenberg got a hold of an alien film? Yeah. You, you know who the first director they talked to to do these two films was, don't you? David Cronenberg? It was Rennie Harlan. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Well, well, is there an opposite of getting cast? I can do the movie. I can do the movie real good. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> I and this was even, in there. And this was even she before. She's got the, the teeth. You love her. This is before his 20 year stint as the director of Die Hard 2. <laughs> his 20 year stint as the director of Die Hard 2. Brilliant. So. Well, so, of course, what happens? Everything starts falling apart. They can't contain the virus. To I like to cut worse. Rhode Island for the record. <laughs> Thanks, Modine. <laughs> for, the, for, so, for the record. Um, um, so, of course, everything goes crazy. They end up finding the alien queen, and this is a nice twist. They they get her. She's they done. But what happens? Her egg sacs explode, and they this virus goes into the fan system of the... Of the, of the of anchor point. Well, right, yeah, because now because now the, uh, yeah. the, the 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 xenomorphic infection is now viral. It can be airborne. Mm -hmm. Um and also uh Gibson added uh, ch like the chest bursters can now come out of wounds. Like the chest bursters it's have so like so crowded. So it's yeah, like, yeah, so it's like so you got three, oh, four, yeah. five chest bursters shivers, coming out man. of yeah, that's it's that's the super body. shivers. Yeah. yeah. Well, well and it also reminds me of all the stories you hear about, you know, people who get bitten and then spiders burst out of the yeah. sore. Yeah. Kind the of bite thing. in the leg is the yeah. one that Here's, I just yeah. I shuddered. And, and when I think about that, uh, I go to, uh, like, The Mist, the film version of The Mist, when they're in the pharmacy, and that little spider creature bites them, and then the body falls and it breaks, and Ugh. that's kind of the vibe I was getting from this. Can I read my favorite passage? Please. Uh, speaking of the chest bursters, the, the, the new and improved chest bursters. Uh, the lab tech is backing away from Tatsumi, who lies on his back on the carpeted deck, mouth gaping, eyes showing whites. A tearing sound as Hicks spots Tatsumi's bandaged leg where the dressing is bulging, moving, seeping yellow fluid. A new model chest buster flails its way out of the wound and shuttles into the shadows beneath the chair. T twin red spots appear on Tatsumi's white shirt. Two more of the things rip their way through his stomach as he arches backwards, groaning. 
the groan cut off as a fourth chest burster pops from his mouth. <laughs> that is so awesome. If, if you could hear a cringe, you would hear oh, mine right yeah. now. Ryan's just like, yeah, you're totally embryonic here. Just it's like, not okay. It's the one that comes out of the leg that just kills me. Awesome. Previous to that, he they discovered this wound. They were trying to figure out what the damage had done. And we're skipping ahead a bit in the script, but they are trying to figure out what damage had been done, and they discover that half of his calf is gone, but that the acid in the mouth has basically cauterized the wound, and so they couldn't see yeah, that yeah. that had already happened to him. Well, yeah. speaking of parallels, so of course at this point, things have gone crazy. Too many people have been infected. They're smart. They, they act intelligently. They try to shut things down. Much like Alien and Aliens, their own technology often works against them, um, keeping with that theme of, of America versus Vietnam, that the, the, the powerful technologically advanced army cannot overcome the, 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 the less advanced uh, xenomorphic, xenomorphic is savage army. Um, and uh, so, of course, um, we have the, the uh, at, a, at a certain point, things have gone too far. We, we have these great scenes, and they decide, look, we've, we've got to abandon the station. Even about worse, this we've got to scuttle screen, this thing. We've got to blow it up. About this point in the screenplay, too, we're getting into your your commonalities in Alien yep. films. The, 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 the run and chase and kill portion of the film. Tons of that. Yeah. Just a lot of, yeah. Which is going to be a little hard for us to verbalize. Right. If you like pulse rifles, this is the movie for you. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, the interesting thing, back to the parallels... The entire time this is going on, we also find out that all hell has broken loot, uh, broken out on the UPP station, on their ship. And so they actually get called in. They uh, A ship is called in to nuke the, the communist uh, space station. And they start tracking this and watching this happen. And they, they come to the realization that the uh, UPP ends up destroying its own station to stop this. And they really have no choice but to do this. Yeah, the same and there's thing. even that communication between yeah. when they finally reach, uh, because they're, you know, not enemies, but they're I also like it's as, a cold war. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah well, one of us said, you know, why, why is it out there? Well, it's two stations doing stuff they shouldn't, watching each other. It's yeah. a checks and yeah. balance system, of yep. course. Um, Mutual it's, it's North, North Korea, South Korea, yeah, across the border. Exactly. They're, they're, they're 10 feet apart or 20 yeah. feet apart from exactly. one another, and their entire job is yeah. to just see what the other's doing. Yeah. Yet yeah. at the same time, when you parallel the other films, how do you uh, how do you take care of this creature? You nuke it from Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. yeah. that, 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 that the sure. only way to be sure. Yeah. 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 That whole speech is almost to re yeah. redone verbatim. So the, so the climax um, culminates in the, the survivors. So we've got Hicks, uh, Bishop, um, Ro Rossetti. Yeah, Rossetti, some of the, some of the other staff. Um, yeah. uh, Rossetti we got Jackson. is a military leader from, from Anchor Point. Right. We got, we got Jackson. And Rossetti's uh, gotten consumed with guilt a little bit because he let the spooks, right. Fox and Wells, railroad him about the genetic material you know, he's like, hey, this is dangerous. They're like, it's cancer research, yeah, and cancer you, this research. isn't your operation, right. and no matter what you think. We're so now the... he's trying to, like, there's a redemption thing that almost needs to yeah. happen with him. Spence Spence is also the one of the other uh, survivors. We have uh, plenty of cannon fodder. Coley, who I <laughs> thought was going to be the protagonist, <laughs> yeah. is... As a, you know, halfway yep. through the script, he's he's been taken out. Yeah, totally gets infected. And well, in the end, they have to don spacesuits to go outside of the station to try to get into uh, an EEV, a, an escape vehicle, uh, to try to escape the uh, the station. Um, Which uh, Bishop has set to, to blow at yes. a certain time. Yeah. yeah. Now, the fun thing is, uh, so they, they keep, they again, a lot of run and gun. Um, they're running out of ammunition. Very, very similar. We see a lot of counters. A yeah. lot, a lot. Of a counters. lot of, <laughs> we see counters on the yeah. countdown for the, the, uh -huh. the bomb and countdown yeah. on the rifles. A lot of digital rifles. Readouts, folks. Yeah, very Knight Rider. So um, at the end, of course, they, they run out of ammunition. They find themselves on top of this radio antenna out in space, exposed. The aliens are coming up, the ship is going, or the anchor point is going to explode, and what happens? But the Vietnamese commando, who we've seen throughout, in parallel throughout the show, she ends up in, a, in that same fighter, flying in and rescuing this group. And it turns out is doing so knowing that she's dying of, of radiation, radiation poisons. Sickness. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And so they're picked up, uh, she, she rescues Hicks and the others, 
Uh, moments before the anchor point detonates, they're later picked up by the USS, USS Kansas City, which, and I'm tr sorry, I totally blanked. How did Ripley's capsule get to the USS Kansas City, or did they ship it back? Before uh, it they, they, Hicks. Yeah, uh, Hicks, has, Hicks got rid of her when shit started hitting the fan. Yeah, right. Yeah, I remember he, he launched taking, her capsule off on a, on an escape pod. Okay. There, there's, so there's the basically the, the, right. most of the quick cameo that she would have had. Yeah. Is yeah. is him hustling her her <laughs> yeah. capsule and getting it out. <laughs> yep. um, and now the fun part, of course, is at the very end we they're 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 safe on the ship, and we find out the bishop the whole time was holding out. He did have a gun. He did have more ammo. He was saving it for them in case they changed, because his ultimate goal was to protect human life. Yeah, and this he, great line where he says, "I'm taking the long view." Oh, oh, fantastic! Where they, where they, yeah. uh, they, they say, "Well, how could you possibly kill one of us?" And he says, "Oh, well, uh, I'm taking the long view." Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I, there are some really, there are a couple of moments, especially Bishop moments. I thought you needed more time. That I just, oh, I love that guy. Well, here oh, yeah, when they're like, well, yeah, I thought you might need more time, so yeah. I added a couple minutes to the clock. You're yeah. welcome. Just like, yeah, he, he, he knows what the humans need before they know yeah. what they need. Uh, really playing into, I think, I would I, I would say Bishop arguably was a fan favorite from, from Aliens. Oh, gosh, gotcha. yes. sure. Yeah, yeah. There, there's this crazy paternal aspect to him. That, well, that yeah, there's a on. point in the script where, where Bishop, when he's trying to get away from the queen yeah. and he and he movie. makes a reference yeah. you know his hand his fingers run over a console very quickly yeah. and, and, I, and Gibson in the script makes reference to the to knife, the knife trick. Trick. To the yeah. Knife yeah, yeah because because it's uh, what he's trying to set up the bomb he's trying to that's ba right. basically he's trying to hack it's, yeah. it's uh, without him using those words that's what's happening is yep. he's trying to find a place in the system where there's a vulnerability that he can because he doesn't have he tries to go through the front door and and authenticate the computer won't let him in, and so he has to find some way through a lower level of the computer system to be able to get to the nuclear army codes. I think it's worth noting too, since it's written by Gibson. There's a there's kind of a a, a cat and mouse scene, and uh, because there's like a geo eco dome going on in this place too. Yes, it's yes, got it's like nice. a little you know like virtual rainforest and. And animals and stuff like that, uh, which I never really understood. The, the they had a real was, lemur. Yeah, they who had ends up getting getting impregnated yeah. and turning it, or uh, not impregnated, but it's gets the, the virus. Alien lemur. We have alien lemur. Yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of want to leave a lemur alien as a pet. Yeah. What? So, so they do that, right? That's right. A, that's a really kind of cool moment. Yeah. You, you find something that's never been turned before, and we get to watch that. Why do we go through an entire scene of aquaculture where oh, there are fish gosh. there, and we don't get? I really want because he imagine? literally says, "Oh, well, we need to break up the visuals." Okay, I'll put them in a garden. I'll well, put them in a jungle, and that, I'll put them in and, in and the that scene where oh, they well, go well, into the fish farm—that's what I mean. The has has a has kind of a cheap, uh, cheap uh, jump scare. Yeah, where they're yeah. where they oh, they're yeah. just really hungry. Well, they should have gone yeah. piranha. On yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Cameron would approve. Yes, he would. But uh, I, I I also want to go back to uh, what I was originally saying, and uh, that whole thing with the circuit boards and all the fiber optics. In that in that one room with the alien creeping around, I think that's like a direct like, hey, this is cyberpunk. We yeah. gotta have like fiber optics <laughs> and like circuit boards and stuff in here and stuff. You know, you bring up a really good point. I've, I've read everything that Gibson's written, um, so I'm a really big fan. And the hope is right that this is gonna be a movie where he brings all of his his outlook on things. I, I mean, his stuff is really stark, it's glossy, it's industrial, and so it's, it's a really nice meld. So you're kind of hoping it's 80% Gibson and 20% yeah. Aliens, and that's swapped. You yeah. get very yeah, little. Right. You, you can see some Gibson, and most of it has to do with, like, tech names or... Uh, there, there's the occasional touch here and there, but there's not a lot of William Gibson in no, this No, there is. I, I, one of my favorite small Gibson touches is with the Vietnamese commando. And it talks about how she wears a sleeveless fatigue blouse revealing regimental tattoos, a yin-yang, hash marks, an ID marker like a supermarket barcode. That Wait, is pure Gibson. Yeah, absolutely. Right and makes it, in, makes it into Fincher's. Yeah, movie. we'll talk about that, uh, what survived. I wonder how much of this stuff is going to make it into... Uh, oh, uh, oh, come on. Uh, the new... Uh, yeah, Blonde Camps. Uh, Blonde Camps. Alien... Uh, the Alien 5. Yeah. Or whatever they're talking about. Son. Oh, we're awesome. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is going to... wonder how many elements out of this we're going to see in Blonde we Camps. Can, while he's looking that up, we can edit this and it'll go. So the conclusion. 
kind of it's everything kind of wraps up nicely and a little too nicely as far as I'm concerned. A dude apparently makes it back. The whole time I thought, oh, something bad's going to happen. It never does. Ripley's okay. And in the end... Because they needed it for they needed her to right, be okay definitely for the next film. Maybe Newt was going to be yeah. part of the next film Which is as well. interesting to note, too. I this agree. is before yeah. film companies thought about, and studios thought about doing films like this. Yeah. You know, it became... You know, people hear, oh yeah, they made all three at one time. Yeah. That was really odd. That was the Peter Jackson, Jackson did that with Lord of the Rings. Well, they, well even before that, future, with uh, you, Back to the Future yeah, Part 2 and 3. three. Yeah. yeah. So the, the ending here, though, is kind of interesting because they, they tie it all together with Bishop giving this, um, basically a lecture saying, well, now look, we can all work together. This com The UPP soldier was working with the with the colonial marines, and they've all come together, and the real enemy here is the aliens. Um, he says, yeah, I, I want to read this, but now you've seen the enemy, Hicks, so has she. She's not it, and neither are you. This is a Darwinian universe, Hicks. Will the alien be the ultimate survivor? The end. It's very Plan Nine from outer space. Will the humans And then two learn? more question marks yeah. after it. Yeah. The, the she in that sentence is that the, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese commando. commando. Yeah. So here, here's a place where I have a bit very of an specific. issue. Um, I love that there's a bit of an Ouroboros here where you, you have alien is basically a commentary on Vietnam War. Yeah. Um, and then for the third movie, we actually have a Vietnamese person right. in the right. movie. Why not give her a name? Uh, yeah, she was very critical Commando. to the story. She literally is the deus ex machina that yeah. saves our people. Yeah. It would have been nice to maybe have had a... She's the first person, yeah. The first I, new character we see and the last character would, we... It would have really yeah. been lovely to have yeah. uh, paid the... I, I get the... To, this Ray Don Chong could have played her because... Maybe. Because that's exactly that's, that's, who they would have chosen sure, at that point. Sure, sure. They, they have well, very few options. she's not too options. ethnic, but she can play Vietnamese. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I get that we're only 10 years after the war and that sensibilities may not have been along those lines, yeah. but 30 years later, it feels a little weird to have a character that is that much of the action yeah. and not okay. have no idea. Yeah. Well, so let's. Uh, that's an extremely good point because that's the kind of note that an executive would and should have have given. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of the executive. Why would you have said no? Let's start with no first. No to the script. Well, uh, Gibson, as great as some of his description is, as great as uh, he's able to write action. Uh, one of my biggest problems with the script is lack of mobility. There's a lot of sitting around and talking. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, from a novel standpoint, that's perfectly fine. But from a film standpoint... It's very intellectual, very cerebral film. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that you, uh, you have these static scenes where a lot of information is being given, but nothing else is going on, I, I, I think you could potentially uh, lose your audience right, it, in those and it, scenes. It even opens there, like... We get a really long computer monologue. That, well, the, even that opening one yeah. we just that read, sets it's up, a little long. It, it's it, specific. It really, it really feels like, hi, I'm Dr. Exposition. Let me tell you <laughs> about where we are in this in, in the story. But who's to say uh, a, a certain uh, style of director and a certain style of editor wouldn't have... Uh, come in here and, and fixed a lot of yeah. that. Sure. You, you throw some good visuals underneath sure. that narration. Because it's the visuals, it, it's open to it. Absolutely. That opening scene, too. That's some good. We've got good action, mm -hmm. good tension, a, an intriguing premise. Where was the heart of this film? Because in the in Alien, um, it, which is much more a horror movie, but you do care about these characters. Kane, you kind of feel it when he goes down. You, you like this guy. They've taken some time. Aliens is is undeniably this. Well, it's the surrogate mother daughter yes, relationship. Yes, powerful. I think that's a problem with this yeah. screenplay. Actually, where's the heart? Is yeah, they get where's rid the emotional look. They get rid of the two reasons for Hicks, right, to be there, which is either Ripley or Newt. This is a great. They're comic gone. Book, they're they're by safe. The way. They're they're yeah. they're. That's right. Dark Horse Comics adapted this into a three issue miniseries. Really? No, I didn't know yes, that. They did. I did not know that. Yeah. This is a perfect, I, I didn't know that either. Like perfect comic. But I, I elements so. of this popped up in a weird uh, Sega video game too. Huh? Yeah. Uh, the well, the UPP. Well, and huh. and and, huh. and the Dark Horse series. Um, I have the actually the actually uh, a Newt. Newt is a lot older. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, she's aged and she and Hicks have a relationship. I think too. I, you know, I actually. Oh, but that's, think that's, that's not that. off the screenplay. That's not off the screenplay? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you I have, I have every alien comic ever oh, made. Do you really? Cool. Yeah. If, cool. if uh, I'm an executive and yeah. I'm expressing a concern, here's my major one. Uh, like we said, this swings hard in the beginning. Like, mm -hmm. like there are some real punches being thrown in the first pages, and it feels a lot like he was on a deadline, yeah. and he reached the end of the deadline. By the time we get to the end of the script, not only is, you know, I'm saying that maybe 20% of William Gibson comes out in the script, yeah. uh, there's nothing of him at the end. It is boom, 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 and here we are, and we're done, and it feels a, feels very rushed and, and very hit, much like a, like an unfinished well, script. And it hits all of the beats of a Aliens. Sure. It really, other than a rescue scene at the end, it yeah. gets all of the. And beats. going into like, like you said, Ryan, like it's full of counters, like like digital counters. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it 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 does bounce between being alien and aliens, and I don't think it adds a whole lot to the mythology. And you, and you're getting in a weird trap about this point with the franchise too, which is. How many times can you do the old dark house or the contained environment? Mm -hmm. It's like how many hallways can or you the creep evil through? Company or with yeah, it's like you know it, everything's contained. The, that's why I, I I think it was smart with the 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 draft they went with for part three uh, that was filmed, even though a lot of people don't like it. It broke the mythology open a little bit. It got it onto a planet, yeah, as well, and not just LV four twenty seven, but uh, right, right. a planet. Well, let me, let me ask you. It didn't, it didn't yeah, well, drive the franchise forward. I can see why it wasn't made. I'll put it that way. And again, right. like the, the the emotional core was lacking in it. I wanted to see more Spencer and more Tully. But see, that was part of my problem. Is I feel like it did drive the the trans the the it's it is the movie for me. In fact, this is the next question I want to ask. Why would you have said yes, or what did you like about the script? I liked the fact that the story did continue. I felt, and we'll talk about Alien Three here in a minute, the, the final one, but. I like Hicks. I like his story. He's a great character. This is 87. Rambo, the action hero, is a big deal. I can see how this thing would be. You could sell this. I'll go the other side of the uh, the emotional center yeah. uh, argument, and that is that this a little bit presaged uh, the feel of Walking Dead for me in that mm -hmm. nobody is safe. Right. There is there is nobody to hang your oh, hat you on. Could totally turn, you could totally skin this as a zombie as a, I, oh, well, we could go in here could. and just switch a few words and and, and call it an original yeah. zombie screenplay. Yeah. But that's yeah. compelling as a yeah. as a horror especially, movie. Yeah, is, especially with the fast xenomorph change now, mm -hmm. which is like the quick infection. Yeah, exactly. That's um, the, I would have said yes to this because this is what the, <laughs> this is this is the type of movie I was hoping for with Alien Three. Me too. Uh, yeah. I felt like okay, the first Alien is great. It's the monster in, in the haunted house in, in, in space, um, you know, and, and, and the monster's picking out people one by one. Uh, and then Cameron took that story, took that universe, and kind of flipped it on its head with this uh, very action-packed uh, story. And, and, and I felt like he raised the bar, and I wanted that bar to be raised a little bit more and I and, and even though I enjoyed the the actual Alien 3 movie uh, when I first saw it I was a little disappointed because I felt like they took a step back by going back to yeah. one monster taking yeah. out people one by one yeah, we, yeah. we went back to the formula of the first film I wanted a continuation of the second film I, I loved the second film that much which, which at, at the end of the day really is the the, the true risk of the Xenomorph right, right. It's, it, it's not one of them getting to Earth, it's them taking over everything. Yeah, and that requires the I did like the intimacy of part three though. Yeah. I did like the intimacy of it. And I like the way that so far the franchise has tended to bounce between an intimate one and then a big one and then an intimate one and a big one again. I think the I think yeah. the new one by Belong Camps is just gonna be big, 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 big. And again I think we're gonna see a lot of elements of, of this draft in well, particular. I, was gonna say, I think Camp's we're gonna thing. see a continuation because he's he he, he you know he ignores <laughs> he ignores Jaws two through four, Poltergeist two <laughs> and three, and Alien three. He yeah. ignores it. Um, they are alive. Let's let's. Uh, so so alive. I yeah. I don't know much about what Blomkamp is is planning. Is he is he planning to ignore the third one? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the fourth and, one and too. Pick up, and, right? and, and, yeah. and and yeah. his it's film a, is going to pick up really after Aliens. It's a sequel to Aliens. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 
So, um, okay. Well, I mean, I, I, and the studio's down because they're like, hey, new canon time. If Star Wars can do it, you yeah, exactly. all this stuff. Well, and. and we do need a uh, uh, kind of scary sci-fi franchise for grown-ups, and again, like stuff like Deadpool, showing you that rated R genre stuff can hit really it's hard. Still, I think play. I think a new I think a reinvigoration of the Alien franchise could be one of the biggest things we've seen in a while. Yeah, uh, Prometheus. Uh, well, we, we right, yeah, it was a weird, too many ideas. Uh, yeah, too uh, many ideas. Back to this uh, script. We we talked about how you know. As we got into the early '90s, the wall had fallen. Yeah, the Cold War was over. I was seeing the same thing. But now, with the war on terrorism and the things going on in the world, um, there's a lot of room for this material yeah. to be there taken no and there, to be sure. refashioned. You could even put a Trump kind of character into this situation. <laughs> right? I'm dead serious. As yeah. long as he dies. Terribly. <laughs> can, that's can I, fine. You know, there's one other Big thing way. about this script that struck me, and that's that there's a lot of the stuff that was left as subtext in the first two movies that feels very textual here. Like, you get Cold War concerns in the first two movies, yeah. and now we actually talk about the Cold War right. out it's, in it's, the open. There's no subtlety here. There, that, that, thank yeah. you. That's exactly yeah. where I'm heading. Is this, this feels very on the nose to me in a lot of ways, and... In fact, we get a moment where one of the characters talks openly about the military-industrial complex. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, which which makes no sense because the point at which you're ensconced in a society where Weyland Yutani is country and the colonial, and yeah, come the, on. You, military-industrial complex. Just, nobody's gonna. That no. that's not a thing. No. You're, you're living in the middle of it, and yeah. so you're you're not gonna have a sense of it. What do you guys think though about? Um, what did you ultimately think about his concept of the xenomorphs, uh, the use of a virus? Did that undermine... I didn't like it. You didn't like it? I didn't like the werewolf-style transformations, and I didn't like uh, the multiple chest bursters. I thought it was trying too hard. It's good visual, and it's always up yeah, in the ante. Yeah, that's but maybe but a little like too much. That's exactly why it was written, yeah. though. It didn't feel like it was organic to the actual progress of the mythology itself. It felt like they were just trying to one-up and ship. Like, we had a bunch of these and this, and we got to do this well, over here. Yeah. And part of that was kind of a natural extension of this idea to, to create a, a new type of xenomorph right. from, from taking the alien well, and human DNA. This is this combined. is where I get into like parallels with, with this franchise, and in particular the Romero, uh, the first three Romero dead films, too. And I, I feel kind of the same way. A, I want to point out a similarity between this and Day of the Dead, which is the military yeah. complex versus science, right. which has never, ever been as pronounced in the Aliens films. It says, Aliens was corporate... You it know, was what, yeah. We, yeah, it was corporate greed. Yeah. This is this is like science versus military, a lot like Day of the Dead. Uh, ironic that it's the third installment, right. one of the darkest right. uh, of, of, of the lot at all. But There's probably a lot of just, gelling in this, yeah, too. Just like I love the inevitability of slow zombies. You can run, yeah. but you can't hide. Yeah. The, the tortoise is eventually going to overtake the hare. Um, I like the gestation period, which for me creates... For lack of a better word, I, it makes me feel worse off for the person. The inevitability of what's eventually going to happen. It's male They're trying to emotionally deal with it. Be like, oh my god, this is going to happen to me. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, like the 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 crawling terror. It's, Rather than, oops, I got bit. Oh, it's that great moment in Dawn of the Dead. You know, where they're sitting there in that bedroom and he's just Peter, waiting for yeah. Peter to turn. Yeah. I don't want to come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You talked yeah. about there being too many ideas in Prometheus, and yeah. this feels like the same. Like it almost feels like he's presenting a menu yeah. of here are some of the ways that we yeah. ought to, we ought to yeah. push the uh, sure sure yeah. draft. Let's it just, is kind of a menu, right? Let's there choose a lot one. Of mistakes in this draft. I mean, he wrote this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Hick, 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 yeah. Yeah. hick. It's hick. hicks. Damn it, hicks. <laughs> I hope he got real pain. That's all I'm saying. I hope Gibson got a nice. I think it was the right time in his career. Yeah, he he, he was definitely the hot property. Yep. I think it's. I just wish this is a time in Hollywood where this is a time in Hollywood where where screenwriters, uh, especially doing films like these, were being paid very well. And we still had enough executives in place from this from the '70s who understood talent and edgy did not mean non-commercial. Right. Sure. I mean, they had, around the same time, they had Cronenberg doing a uh, Total Recall draft. Yeah. So, you know, it's like... That would have been interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah right. around the same time, they're talking to Dave Lynch about doing Return never, of the Jedi. Sean, is, yeah. that, is, yeah. is that version yeah. of Cronenberg's Total Recall ever... I uh, have it. Uh, oh, oh, I have it. All right. Future episode. Future episode. So excited. <laughs> Let me, I saw a weird parallel 
And it's funny because the script would have been written around this same time uh, because it took so long to, to produce this film. This has a very similar plot line to Gremlins 2. Huh. You have a, yeah, a man with knowledge about uh, an evil alien force but about which no one, and no one believes him. He goes to a new job um, where he starts to hear that something's going on, finds out that there's an evil science division, and then has to work with people to stop the monsters from taking over yeah. because science made it worse. Gremlins 2. Yeah. <laughs> and, and can I say that of all the people I know... Yeah. You're probably the only one that would have picked up on that. You have an, an unhealthy obsession with Gremlins and Gremlins too. Charlie Haas, man. He, he, yeah, yeah. I think he's he's got to talk to Gibson, get that thing done. <laughs> well, 1992, David Fincher makes a little film called Alien Three. Yeah. Let's talk about the. Let's talk about a couple of things here. Let's talk about that movie. Your feelings about that movie, and let's also talk about what we think survived or what should have survived into the final draft. Ten or nine scripts later. I so, can't really think of anything that that made it into the barcode. The barcode, and the idea that the xenomorph could come out of an animal. Oh, okay, the, the, sure, yeah. Comes out of that See, big I space equate, yeah. I equate yeah. That to the toy line. Yeah, because remember, of course, you had yeah. like the xenomorph the bull. bull. Yep. Yeah, and that's interesting yeah. that in which was the toy line before three. I think it was after. I, I think it was after. I think, I think you're right. That's, yeah. that's interesting that it comes out of a yak or, or space yak. For an alien space yak. that never existed. In the version yeah, you so. saw, in the theatrical version, it yeah. comes out of a dog. Yeah, That's right. Okay, yeah. now, to be fair. And I right. love that xenomorph. Guys, I love the dog xenomorph. Full disclosure. The, the POV stuff and yeah. the way it's able to skitter around. Full disclosure, I read Chris Hicks' review <laughs> back in 1992 and I made a conscious decision not to see this film and not to ruin it. I loved Alien and I loved Aliens. So, I officially saw Alien 3 for the first time this weekend. And you told, um, um, Sean, you told me the best one to see is the assembly cut, the direct, is the, the producer's, producer's cut. cut. Yeah. And I watched that. How did it treat you? Sit with it, man. It's, no, it's, it's so, terrible. It's, it's, it, it is a long, mark, mark, drawn out. To be to be completely fair, to be completely fair to this yeah. film. Yeah, I saw it in the theater. We went opening night. Yeah. Very excited. Yeah, me too. Walked out disappointed. Me too. With each viewing yeah. of this film, I like it better. It's a and Pixies better. album, dude. It's yeah, a black but, metal record. But, it's but, weird. But, it's like it's a movie. Okay, that's fine. And I think yeah. I was thinking as I'm watching this again, equating it to George Romero, Land of the Dead. I, yeah. For some reason, I I say I hate that movie. Why have I seen it 25 it, it, times? Why have I seen The Phantom Menace at least 30 times? Like, why? Hey, it's a movie. Does, I'm sorry. How dare you, You know sir. how I feel, but... I do. What I will say about Alien 3... And Brian my, Young's my impression, just I, know. Fire. <laughs> I love it. No, true story. Alien 3, watching it, I, I went in with an open mind. I'm like, okay, let's... And I really enjoyed the visuals of this film. I thought it was a visually very arresting film. I thought oh, the it was color palette's great. David Lynchian. He likes to um, Fincher plays around with a lot of ideas that you see from Dune. A lot of these uh, multiple images overlaid on these these strange um, vistas. Um, There's a lot of Ridley Scott. There is in there. I've seen a black and white version of it too because it's a damn near monochrome film anyway. I would because it is just too long. The characters are all bald and bland. The same guy. <laughs> Charles Dutton gives a fantastic. And Charles Dance, the two Charles in the well, film, the, the Dance and Dutton are fantastic in it. But why? Tywin Lannister is the love interest. Yeah, I was going to say Charles Dance is great, but it is so riddled or riddly with. I'm um, sorry. I'll shut up. <laughs> wow. I know. I'm sorry. It's just I don't know what's wrong with you tonight. <laughs> Many things. I'm okay. Right with you. I just I just feel like the film is just mired in this. Early '90s heroin chic MTV uh, tort or proto torture porn. Well, you know what David Fincher did before exactly. he did this movie. All he the Nine did, Inch Nails. He, he did the Madonna videos. videos. Yeah. yeah, and Madonna videos. Yeah. Now he's got a great style. Um, and and Ryan, I think you said before, a great eye for visuals. Yeah. He has since learned to tell a great story. Absolutely. And I think it, it happened somewhere after this movie. Yeah. This feels to me like if you gave a really... It happened during Fight Club. Yeah. I think the game is a good Fincher movie. It's I think game too. Yeah. I it was. Yeah. It is. Yeah, the game is good. I, I feel You're like... You have to have a criterion edition. This is a student film. This is an arty student film with a lot of money. With a budget. And a, lot of, a huge budget. Yeah. Do you I know think the, it's got one of the most disappointing and ridiculous endings. Uh, do you oh. know the term making your real... So yeah. there's this procedure for filmmakers where um, 
uh, especially directors, where they need to have product to show people to, to audition for jobs. And so you put together a show reel of some of your best right. work. And it shows and, you different styles. But, Bands will do it with demos too. But, the ballad, the heavy one. The a lot of times that has a, it has a detrimental uh, association in that uh, there are directors who will make their reel, and it kind of goes in quotes in that case, uh, where they basically will take a producer's money and under the guise of making one movie, make a completely different one, and Alias 3 feels like him making his real yeah. movie. It There's feels a great movie called Branded to Kill by Saijin Suzuki, an all Japanese exploitation director who made, wrote quickie films, you know, made like 40 films a year, and he said, I'm gonna do what I want, and he made uh, an art classic under the, uh, right under the nose of his producer. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, and in this case, it feels- That's what this feels like. It too. feels a little like it's very he's, he's taken a bunch of money, and he wants to get some shots that he thinks are really, really and cool. he does, he gets some gorgeous stuff. And it's but subversive, have... that's part of what I like about it, though. Huh? Even though it's completely imperfect, it's subversive. But is that the movie I wanted to see? Is that the, is that the Alien 3 that I wanted to see? I don't mind it as long as they keep making more alien films and some and a move yeah. like that does not kill the franchise. Well, then it got even worse. Well, and, yeah, well, I was going to yeah. say, moving yeah. forward, yeah. Yeah. Alien yeah. Resurrection yeah. made Alien 3 look all that much better. Yeah, yeah. But no, God, I, that's got some beautiful moments in it, too. Uh, the, the, the underwater scene and and the fact that it's directed by a uh, Juno or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Delicatessen. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It's beautiful. It, it's it's one of the things that he wishes yeah. he could erase off yeah. his resume. I think, I think Resurrection suffers from too much amalgamation of old drafts. You see, again, ideas yeah. out of this, yeah. out of drafts that weren't written for that film at all. The Star Wars Set pieces. The Star Wars IP is really famous for yeah. not throwing anything away, right? They're like, good at it. Like, they will grab uh, this... This last episode of Rebels that was on Saturday, you start hearing things, Sorry. words like Bendu, and yeah, yeah, so amazingly good, so good, so good, good. So good. amazingly Sorry. good, and it's it, it the Alien franchise feels like the the flip side to me, like yeah. all the bad ways that you can grab stuff from old and grab a concept that doesn't belong and just sort of squash it in and yeah. hope that nobody will notice. It, it really just felt like executives going, eh. Yeah. Good can, you get it, can you get it in on time? Does it got shiny bugs in it? Yeah. <laughs> and they fought tooth and nail with Fincher. It was a, it apparently he. I mean, he has disavowed this film. Sure. And he, it's not one of his. Well, that's why there's a producer's cut, well, and not you, a director's you know, cut. You know, and it's and it's it's of course because it's a franchise. It's a lot of the same people involved in. And there was a writer who did another draft who we won't mention by name, but he's going to come on the show about uh, about his Lost Boys prequel. So if you want to dig. You can find out, but the guy, a really great screenwriter and director in his own right, uh, did an Alien 3 draft, and we were going to go over that too as well, remember? And uh, and he asked us not to because of going through so much shit with the producers. He quoted Truman Capote to me when we had the conversation, but he goes, he goes, I typed the screenplay, I didn't write it. Oh. <laughs> he That's goes, he awful. goes, please, Jeez. please oh, do not talk about no. it. Don't, don't tell anybody where to get it. He goes, it was one of the worst uh. periods of my life. You know, so, yeah. That's well, hard to hear. Yeah. Well, any parting thoughts before I ask the final question of the group? Um, I would have still rather have seen this than the Alien 3 that I got. That was my question. Okay. And would I you, like, want, and I would like you have Fincher's... rather seen this movie? Actually, no, this should have absolutely. Been... Yeah. Yep. yeah, me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Even with all these problems, because I think an editor... A good director. Well, and, and we have and to ass- we, have, we have to assume that even even with William Gibson or another writer, there would have been some revision processes. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to be a real geek, you 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 can find the screenplay online, and since it is so readily available, maybe we'll just go ahead and provide a link. Awesome film. Um, awesomefilm.com. Yes, yeah, something like that. And uh, but you could say that this is uh, Alien Two Point Five, yeah. and that the filmed Alien Three happens after this or concurrently with it <laughs> yeah. while Hicks That's launches true. Ripley off in her space yeah. capsule you know, she yeah. she winds up on the prison planet. She winds there up on go. the prison planet. Also remember this is the first draft. I Absolutely. I have to wonder what you know what Gibson's process is to start with. If yeah. he if he had a second there or is. third shot if he shows 1988, up. Nineteen eighty eight, one year later he writes a second draft. He changes some he makes some significant changes. Yeah. There's no longer an army of new beasts. There are only three aliens on the, the ship. Basically, he, okay. he just, he kind of eviscerates his whole, his, the whole premise here. Well, and, and, and it's and probably in, collabor- it down, it's probably down, in collaboration with Guyler and Hill that, yeah. where yeah. some yeah. of those decisions were made. Yeah, of course. Because uh, this would have cost $17 bazillion dollars to yeah. shoot. Yeah. Oh, especially back then. Yeah. The, All the miniatures and... Yeah. 
the the actual uh, internet address for the script is awesomefilm.com backslash script backslash alien three digit dot, or dot word txt three. Uh, digit alien capital A L I E N the number three dot d- text yeah and if you just TXT. simply Google search alien three William Gibson screenplay it's gonna pop right up on you well that's it. For this episode of the Script Trip, any other parting, parting thoughts? Nope, that's all. I'm, I'm done. I'm talked out. All right. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm Mark. I'm Ryan. And I'm Blake. Please join us next episode when, uh, should we decide on the movie right now? Wow. Decide live? What do you got? What do you got? Yeah. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Let's do, let's, let's have a, let's do a couple of choices. We have, um, Cronenberg's, uh, Total Recall, which we mentioned. <laughs> I'm going to be making a lot of those sounds like somebody's <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a modernized creature from the Black Lagoon uh, draft that I have that takes place in the rainforest. And there's okay. like eco, hmm. uh, you know, it's ecologically minded, of course. Uh, or draw John Straczynski's, I'm not going to give my opinion on it, even though I've already read it, uh, Forbidden Planet screenplay, which is, serves more oh, as a wow. prequel than a sequel. Huh. Uh, Total Recall. Total Recall. Total, Total Recall. Recall? David Cronenberg's okay, Total Recall. Okay, next episode, David Cronenberg's <laughs> Total Recall. And then uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll also be doing uh, The Unmade Lost Boys 2, which was going to be a prequel. Uh, I'll go ahead and spill it now. Written by Eric Red and was going to be directed by Joel Schumacher. Hey, falling down Schumacher, I'll take him any day. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'll take Amazing. that Schumacher any day of the week. Amazing. And the, the stuff I've heard about what they had planned about this film makes me really sad that it didn't happen yeah. and we got a bu- bunch of surfing vampires on moving water uh, it doesn't make any sense but you know well, that's what we do in the spa- script grip. sparkle and go out in the sunshine a couple of decades later so true that with shoe knocker nipples anyway thanks for listening to episode one of the script crypt where we went over william gibson's alien 3 screenplay please attend salt lake city comic con if you're in the area and hit us up on facebook at the script crypt later Good night, until we meet.